views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of BronxNet or the program underwriters. Welcome to Bronx Talk. As you well know, the nation is dealing with some very large issues that are affecting all of us and all of our lives. I mean, do I have to list them for you? We have the pandemic. It led to economic collapse, sky right, uh, skyrocketing unemployment, uh, not to mention uh, widespread social unrest throughout the nation, and it's even a spread throughout the world. One of the theories we're going to deal with this evening is that Maybe there's a tie that binds all of these uh, issues, and uh, that is economic disparities, that maybe some people have not had a chance to uh, participate in some of the bounties that America has to offer for any number of reasons. Um, and uh, we're going to uh, try and take a look at poverty and uh, some of those uh, economic disparities that very sadly leave some people uh, behind. Uh, tonight, we have uh, two experts from Here to Here, an organization designed to enhance paths to uh, rewarding careers for young people by uniting employers, educators, and community-based organizations in the Bronx and in the city. Uh, he's also the executive director of PIC, the uh, Bronx Private Industry Council. Always nice to see Dr. Edward Summers back on Bronx Talk. Nice to have you, sir. Good to see you, Gary. Good to be here. And also a credit union development educator who is a senior vice president of membership and, um, and network engagement at Inclusive Network, which is a not profit that helps low and moderate income people in communities achieve financial independence through credit unions. It is Mr. Pablo Filippi, sir. Nice to have you with us. Well, thank you for having me, Gary. Really appreciate it. I also will mention to our audience in our second segment toward the end of the show, Senator Gustavo Rivera will join us. And he's going to join us to talk about uh, some new legislation uh, about uh, COVID-19 that actually is very interesting. So we'll deal with that in the second part. But right now, uh, let's start with you, Dr. Summers. Um, you uh, sent me a, a list of um, kind of bullet points of uh, agenda items that you think we ought to uh, really take a look at in terms of how to correct this whole panorama of economic disparities that uh, got right in the middle of uh, literally all of the crises that I just talked about. What I want to uh, pick up on, and it's something that I think the education systems have missed, and it's been called for for a long time, and that is the notion of vocational training, apprenticeships, making that connection between, well, you learn good stuff in the classroom, and God bless all our teachers, but now we want to make it mean something. So talk to me about how a new look at apprenticeships might work and how it might affect uh, the opportunity to advance and get out of the, the, the grip of poverty. Sure, and thank you, Gary. I think one of the big things that we often miss is that, that connectivity between academia and industry. Uh, I think we often work in silos. Uh, and we uh, at Here to Here, the Bronx Private Industry Council and CareerWise New York, fundamentally believe that there needs to be better connections between academia um, industry uh, and community-based organization and government in order to change a system, change a system that often you have educators on one corner, but then you have the employers on the other corner and there's that disconnect. So we have uh, developed a model in particular, modeled mar largely after the Swiss system and developing apprenticeships. Um, and that's under our CareerWise New York program. And essentially what it does is it connects employers to local educators, high school students, where it puts them in a three-year apprentice model, where essentially a young student will gain their high school diploma, gain also college credits while working for three years. And throughout that three years, they'll gain a certain skill sets in business, in IT, uh, in customer service that will allow them a skill set that will be marketable in the marketplace. And while also pursuing their um, high school diploma and their um, a part of their college degree as well. 
that is critical to building a skill set and training our future workforce for the what, future. What, like you that say, often, uh, what you say, Dr. Summers, I understand. I think many people understand, and we've heard these things. I, I don't know how many uh, schools you might be working with in that. To me, the real question is, how do you make it part of the infrastructure instead of advocates, hey, we're working with five high schools, I'm working with three Bronx high schools. And every time I see that stuff, I love it. And you know me, I'll promote those schools and promote those programs like crazy. But I want, you know, we're talking now though, the world is in change. How do we get in there? Is this a matter of saying, hello, uh, Chancellor Carranza, could you get to work here? <laughs> yeah, no, no, g g great point, Gary. And this is all about systems change and really um, change in the system. And I think that what we're doing career-wise is modeling what the system can look like. Career-wise, uh, again, as, as I mentioned, is modeled after the Swiss system, has, which has been very successful um, over time. Um, young people have career pathways. You can either go to university and or you can work because of, um, there's a lot of job prospect and opportunities after you finish high school. And so that is exactly what we're doing is we're working with the DOE, we're working with CUNY as well to really change the system to get them to adopt this model as well so that, that it's a system-wide approach and not just a select few schools working on this particular program. One more question for you about this, and then we'll bring in uh, Mr. D. Filippi. Um, the, the city has Workforce One, and I remember when I, I was introduced to it, and I, I went to a press conference at some point in the Bronx, and all I could hear, you know, I listened very carefully, and all I could hear was this notion that you can get jobs to work, uh, you know, in a store. Or, and these are important jobs for young people, but you know, those kinds of merchant jobs, those kinds of uh, uh, jobs in a store, low level jobs are very good because it puts money in their pocket and everything else. But that's not the career training we're talking about. Workforce one in your mind needs to be redone. And, and in my mind, maybe that's a way in to make the systemic change we're talking about. Absolutely, we, we have uh, workforce one centers uh, all throughout the city in each of the boroughs. Um, you know, what the challenge with Workforce One Centers is that they um, are so driven by the numbers and not necessarily the models. So they're driven by how many, you know, individuals you serve. And that's the outcome that they measure, that measures their success versus that's right. what we think is fundamentally about, wait a minute, like I'm dealing with humans and this is not about just putting you in any old job where you may have to also rely on other different parts of the city's public benefits but it's about really setting you up for your career and setting you up for a lifetime and really putting you on a pathway to um, a family sustained wage and above. And right now, as it's currently constructed, these workforce one centers don't do that. So in the ideal world, what we would do at with these centers is to make sure that as case managers are working with people that they're really thinking about a career track and not necessarily, here's just a job and we just have to fill these jobs because targeted just target, just open in the Bronx and we just have to fill those jobs at Target. It's more really dealing with the systemic issues and I don't think we get to that. Substance is really what you're talking about. And that's exactly the sense I got is that they were said bean counting, okay, we got eight people jobs or whatever it is. 100 people, whatever. Uh, okay, let's bring in the Mr. DeFilippi. Um, you and I were just talking before the program about kind of a new way of looking at banking that will in, be more inclusive. On the other hand, it's really the old way of doing banking. So uh, why don't you just address the importance of credit unions? And then the other thing, and this is very important, is what happened to the PPP and why did certain communities not get them? So let's start with the credit unions. Yeah, and, and I guess I want to just make a connection with Eddie's remarks about uh, system changes and about um, racial injustice and economic injustice go hand on hand, right? There's, when we talk about poverty, we can separate poverty from race and from uh, redlining. So what, what really we have here and what this um, crisis has, you know, shown so clearly is that the, the system, the financial system doesn't work. Doesn't work for many people in this country. Um, there's wh why, would, why would credit unions and that new way of looking at things be, be preferred in your mind? Because, because banks in general are walking away from retail banking. They're walking away from serving everyone in the community, right? So this is a trend that's taken, you know, decades. And as banks retreat, you know, what we have seen in communities is the emergence of 
these payday lenders of check cashers everywhere, right? So there's a disconnect in this financial system in terms of having access to consumers uh, into the financial mainstream. And that connection is credit unions. Credit unions have been around for almost a century in this country, and they came about because there was a gap in the marketplace. A gap that hasn't gone away. In fact, that gap has grown. And we see now millions of people who don't have bank accounts. We have even more people who don't have access to affordable and responsible loans. You know, so uh, I just want to move it along because I, I, I want to get to this PPP thing, which I know uh -huh. is important to, to a lot of people. Um, and so what happens is they, they, um, they don't have the money to invest. They don't get the benefits of it. And then all of a sudden they're behind the eight ball or behind the race as it were. And I don't mean ethnic race, but behind the economic race to development because, hey, I, I can't even put money in a bank, move things, pay my bills, you know, do all the things that, that many people can do. Talk, I, I don't want to keep talking about it. Let's get to it. The Paycheck Protection Program still has about $130 billion left to disperse uh, to help small business weather um, all of the issues that I talked about at the, um, at the start. So two points. Number one, why, why did it not get where it, it, we believe it should go? And number two, what's left and what can be done at this particular point in time? It didn't go um, far enough because, you know, uh, the financial system, again, doesn't get um, deep, enough in, um, deep enough in communities. Uh, that's where we have credit unions that jump into this pay, Paycheck Protection Program and responded to um, providing access to micro and small businesses. If you look at the numbers, you know, the first round of PPP went very quick, but the recipients of those loans were, you know, small businesses, but the top tier of the small businesses. People know? with franchises, maybe with three or four stores, as opposed exactly. to a, a store. And, and now we get into the looting as well on Burnside Avenue. You've got, I mean, I know a guy who makes beautiful clothes, but he, he, that's his store. That's his one store. I mean, you know, he, he's got to be dealt with, right? Because exactly. he's, he's feeding the community. He's feeding a family. He's paying young people to work for him. I mean, that's the, that's the small business economy, right? And that's the borrower that didn't get to this program, right? We still have 120 billion sitting at SBA, yet lenders are saying we don't have demand, but there is a demand out there. You know, we have people, millions of businesses. In fact, uh, I read yesterday that 42 or 44% of all black businesses may not come back. You know, 45% of all Latino businesses may not come back, and yet we have all this money sitting there. So this is where credit unions can really make that difference and become those connectors with access to capital. So what, what do uh, businesses who are listening to us have to do? And I have to tell you, we're going to go back to Dr. Summers in a second. You know, what we have tried to do for the 26 years we've been on this program is offer solutions. If you listen to these two gentlemen, we talk about putting them in the same room and having Dr. Summers people deal with credit unions and have the credit union find a workforce he can work with. This is how we're going to solve problems. So anyway, yes. what do people, uh, Mr. Filippi, what do people need to do to access that money and get it where uh, it should go? Well, we have little time. We only have until June 30th. So if you are in the Bronx, you should be calling uh, neighborhood trust, um, low with side peoples, FCU. They serve this, uh, the Bronx community. I can send you that information, but they need to act now. We are hoping that there's going to be some extension of the program. It's not certain, right? But uh, for all what we know right now, June 30th is the deadline. So there's not a lot of time for people to act. You need to contact a credit union in New York City. Again, I said low with side peoples, Federal Credit Union or Neighborhood Trust. Got it. Um, Dr. Summers, I, I, he's sitting at the edge of his seat and he's just got something to say. And uh, where else to say it but Bronx? Go ahead, Dr. Summers. Yeah. I know you heard a lot there. I, 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 absolutely. And I just wanted to add that um, 
you know, as a part, as the executive director of the Bronx Private Industry Council, uh, we have Spring Bank that's a part of us, which is a local community development financial institution in the Bronx that have been working really hard within the borough to provide PPE to uh, the local Bronx community. And so we do have uh, a great institution in, um, in uh, Spring Bank. Also, uh, the Third Avenue bid and um, a group of us uh, in the Bronx um, created what's called the Bronx Community Relief Effort. And we have been doing a number of webinars and workshops um, to educate local small businesses about the federal options available. And also we've been giving out um, small business loans through the Bronx Community Relief Efforts as well. Actually, not loans, grants. Um, That's even better. Sorry, I like not that. Loans, <laughs> two small businesses to help them um, recover from COVID-19 and all the looting that went on. I do want to touch upon some-, um, some we got about a minute then for you, and then I want to get to Mr. DeFilippi, sure. and I, I want to just address the future. What's, like, what are we doing? I want to do, you know? Yes, I, I want to address something radical that we're doing um, with the Bronx Private Industry Council here to here, is that we're, we, we launched this thing called the Thinkubator, which is our student uh, youth consultancy, where young people are actually, helping businesses solve challenges. And one of the things um, that was mentioned earlier was uh, a lot of people don't bank. And so we worked with Spring Bank on figuring out how to bank the unbanked. So what we're trying to do is really train the future, the young, young folks in the Bronx for the challenges that will exist in the future and for the marketplace. But really quickly, radically, what I really think what needs to happen on top of what we both talked about is there are three things that really quickly, Reparations, I think, is something that we can change our economic system. Baby bonds, which Derek, Dr. Derek Hamilton have promoted, where you give uh, a bond to babies who enter this world uh, from the on start, a bond where it matures over time and allows them to invest in the future. And then a federal job registry, a federal job program where we require, we allow, we, we make it mandated that everyone is um, allowed to have a federal a job. And that's I, backed by the federal government. So I, I like that bond idea, not necessarily because the dollar amount, it's almost like the stimulus money you know that money is going to go but it's an indication that there's a future that there's something to build on that you are worth some you know you've got some in your pocket at the age of one you know right. um mr d Filippi, just uh, then to uh, wrap up your portion of it um let's let oh by the way first uh, dr summers uh, if people want to get to you the uh, private industry council is that what we're talking about That's just right. go to bronx pick that's right. If you go to if you go to the here to here dot org, uh, you can find me on, on that website. Right, and then you can make the contact and with schools and anybody who wants to participate. We're all in, sure. Mister D. Filippi. Um, just talk about um, for you and for the future and what people really need to do. Put out a website. Let's let's make it happen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I I think that we need to demythify what it means to be a financial institution. Um, Eddie mentioned uh, the. The um, uh, Spring Bank is a CBF5. Well, we work with CBF5. Most of the credit unions in our network are CBF5s. This is a new type of banking institution. They need to be supported at the federal level. We have been working on that. Uh, but it's important for the public to understand that having a bank account is not enough, that the true measure of a relationship with a financial institution happens when you're given a loan. If that transaction doesn't happen, that is not your financial institution. And that's what you know, many businesses have found out now. They thought, oh, I have a bank with the, you know, an account with this bank. I'm gonna go there, guess what? They were not enough. You know, right. And if you, get the, if you get that loan, there's a back and forth, they evaluate your credit. And if you go to a bank that says, we can't give you a loan, I don't even wanna, Think about that it could be because of an ethnic thing but it also because you don't you don't rank you don't you don't you know you don't count that ain't but yet we're happy to take your money uh, I, we know that you know anyway uh, what, what website are we using to get to you and uh, your uh, just and, go uh, to inclusive.org inclusive without an e though right without an e that's right right okay hey uh, gentlemen great um you guys are just the best and now i made friends uh, and made you friends which is much more important so now you know yes, Eddie, we'll follow up all right great all right, uh, thank uh, you so pablo much. de filippi and dr eddie summers thank you so much uh, we're going to take a short break we'll be right back gustavo rivera is going to talk uh, new legislation about covid 19 don't go away
Okay, back with you on Bronx Talk, switching gears now, and let's say uh, good evening to the state senator from the 33rd Senatorial District in the Bronx, Gustavo Rivera. Nice to have you with us, Senator. Good afternoon, good evening, good night, wherever you are. Well, it's going to be replayed at all times of the day. So, uh, so much to talk about. We never have enough time, but you had two bills coming out about uh, COVID-19. Uh, talk about, um, and now, now these are proposals, things you've put out in the Senate? Yeah. Yes, and there, there's actually there's actually like eight or ten of them, but there's two in particular that I think are incredibly important to address. Okay. Something that we need to do with right now. Number one, uh, it is related to the contact tracing program. This is the process by which uh, investigators, so to speak, talk to you. And let's say that you, Gary, are, are test positive for COVID, then that investigator would ask you a series of questions about your whereabouts for the last two weeks. You share the information about where you've been, who you've talked to, etc. A lot of personal information. The problem is that if we don't if we don't know that that information is going to be kept absolutely confidential, then that means that a whole host of folks will not trust that person, that investigator, so they won't share the information. The bill would actually uh, guarantee the absolute privacy of this information because we want to make sure that we keep it from law enforcement. It should not be used for law enforcement purposes or for immigration enforcement purposes for it to work. For us to go to any level of normalcy. In, in some ways, it's like the census, so that you should fill yep. that out because, and, and let's leave all that other stuff out exactly. of it because we have a public health situation uh, that yep. we uh, need to deal with. Uh, prospects for passing? I mean, I know you feel confident in a Democratic controlled Senate. Um, think, and, and what is the timing on it? Because you need, it's got to be a water. It's got to be. Yeah, it's, I, mean, I mean, I certainly wish it would have been done already, but we can pass it. Uh, I can tell you that we will be going back to session that we're, we're figuring out what the, we're going to do a series of hearings on a couple of different issues and we're going to go back to session, uh, certainly after the July 4th holiday. Uh, and so we will be going back relatively soon. So hopefully we'll pass then. I, I feel pretty good about it. And bottom line is that this is something that we need to put into law because for this program to be able to work, we need that trust to be there. Uh, so that is absolutely something that hopefully we get done soon. Are you convening uh, in person or do you do these things uh, virtually? We have the capacity to do it virtually. Some of us go to Albany, some of us can stay here. It, we have changed the rules of the Senate to allow us to be able to do our work from right here in our homes until the public health uh, emergency subsides. The second bill addresses something that I thought about from the minute that the pandemic happened, and that, that was this whole idea of who's paying for it. Wow, uh, medical debt. We, we've had tens of thousands, I don't have the numbers in front of me, of bronchitis who've needed care, vital care, life-saving care in, in many cases. Um, talk, to, talk about the, the uh, medical debt collection. Address. So, so the, just to give you a sense of what we're talking about, uh, there is there are the folks that are uninsured, there are folks who are insured, but it, you know, we certainly could talk about the New York Health Act and making sure that we guarantee care for everybody, but you know, we'll do that later. <laughs> That'd be uh, another as show. An example, as an example, one of my staffer's sister, uh, her, she's in her mid-30s, fairly young woman, was could this happened a couple of months ago caught covid wound up in the hospital uh, actually had to be intubated had a medically induced coma thankfully she is back home recovering uh, and this is an insured person and she got a bill for four hundred thousand dollars. oh my goodness that just, and, and, uh, was whoever a, sent that bill what is their expectation unless they sent it to a michael bloomberg I mean, See, this is, the, this is the kind of, this is the problem. This is the reason, and again, we could have a whole conversation about the New York Health Act. The way that, that insurance companies and hospitals work and, and medical practitioners sometimes work is that they will, there's confusion about where the payment should be coming from. There's, and then all of a sudden you think that you are covered. You think that you're insured and all of a sudden you get a bill. Something as ridiculous as that. They have, there was a story in the New York Times about that case just a couple of weeks ago, and the hospital changed their tune a little bit. They're still trying to figure out exactly how much they, they owe, but this bill would actually guarantee that you would, that you would be uh, held harmless from that, uh, from that debt collection that can be predatory. Uh, so it's, it, is, it is absolutely essential that we protect people, particularly folks who, again, through no fault of their own, find themselves sick and depending on the depending on the look of the draw, sadly, they might find themselves, you know, maybe sick in bed for a week, or maybe in an intubator for two weeks. Yeah, uh, and, right. and you know, so we, we need to we need to make sure we do that. But it's not maybe, there's like eight other bills that I've introduced as well, all related to COVID. Maybe this is uh, very related to the New York Health Act or the, the foundation for it. 
because we're all getting, I get bills of all kinds. I mean, you know, visit to the doctor and they took a test and the next thing you know, I've got a $2,000 bill, and, which nobody can really explain. Yeah, we've anyway, dealt with issues of surprise billing before that we need to also, uh, you know, deal with and, and try to resolve. Since we do have you on, and since we are just after the uh, primary election, which frankly in the Bronx was startling. Um, across the city, I would argue, and across the state, it was, it was incredible. I'll let all of them deal with it. I'm talking about my home borough and what I'm responsible for on Bronx Talk. Yeah. Uh, let's see, uh, potentially, we know there's still more ba ballots to be counted. Richie Torres, mm -hmm. uh, Jamal Bowman, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, and Adriano Espeyat. That's your uh, Bronx delegation in Congress. That's in Congress, but also you can't forget about the fact that you have, that you're going to have a couple of new assembly members. Amanda Septim in the South Bronx, a woman of color, very, very smart lady. Chantel Jackson in the 70s. Oh, no, that race is pretty close. There's still 300. No, it, no you're right. That, that Chantel is up, but it's not, but it's not, it's not certain yet, but I feel pretty good about it. I endorse Miss Jackson. I think she's amazing and I hope that she was able to, to pull it off. Uh, and so we have these changes that are happening all across the Bronx. And now you said that you care about your home borough and that's, and that's fine. And I do as well. But I think that we have to see what happened in other places like Brooklyn and Queens and even in Westchester to talk about the, the progressive shift that has happened in the last couple of years is not abating. Uh, you know, and I've said it, you know, I've said it before. I don't have anything negative to say about Elliot Engel, Congressman Engel. Uh, except that is that he was past tense. It's unfortunate, but there is a new energy that is necessary, particularly during these times. I endorsed uh, Jamal Bowman, uh, and I was and I'm very, you know, I was very surprised at the at the you know at the level of his victory. But I think it shows not only the work that they put in, but the 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 hope and the wishes for change that this district had, which includes both the Bronx and Westchester. And he's going to be amazing in that position. You know, if you uh, love America like we do, and you believe in representative democracy, and you take a step back, and I, of course, look at the Bronx every single day of my, my work life, and you see who Bronx people are, this is really, in my mind, the best of democracy, because now there really is a representative democracy. If you yeah. look at who people are um, in the borough of the Bronx, and now you look at who will be representing them, they're younger. They are, in, in many cases, people in, in large majority of cases in, in office of people of color mm -hmm. and people with, frankly, progressive leaning ideas. And that is what I see in, here in, in my home borough. Yeah, yeah. and we're going to continue. This is, this is step two. Step three is next year when we have 2021. It is the city council election, the borough presidency election. There's going to be, these changes are going to continue. And I think that, uh, you know, it is, it, for the last couple of years, uh, sometimes I felt, you know that song from White Snake from the '80s. You know, here I go again on my own. Sometimes I felt because these are these are things that I've been battling for on progressive issues, on on police reform, on housing, on taxation, on healthcare. I've been fighting for these issues forever, uh, and sometimes I haven't had the best of allies. So hopefully this changes. Maria. Then I'm going to take on the final word because I'm going to reach back to music from when I grew up. And that is, and you're going to recognize this, and to me, this is how I defined what happened. Come senators, come congressmen, please heed the call. Don't stand in the doorway, don't block up the hall, because he that gets hurt will be he who has stalled. There's a battle outside and it's raging. It'll soon shake your windows and rattle your walls. The times, the times they are, they are a change. And, that's and on that musical note, uh, Senator Rivera, always a pleasure. And uh, we keep the dialogue going because we're trying to make a better Bronx. That's where we're at. Take care of yourself, sir. Thank you so much. Folks, uh, good night. Thank you to our producer, Helen Greenberg. Listen, we're positive about the Bronx. And next week, we'll be talking with Bronx high school students who have achieved incredible things with their artwork. They've been in museums. They've been shown all over the city, maybe even further than that. It's another way to fight disparities and help people stay healthier and be more productive. Thanks to Helen. Thanks to you. Thanks to the senator. Thanks to our other two guests. Good night.